Okay, today's topic is um, from section 8.9, and what we're talking about now is trying to be able to take as many functions as possible and represent them with an infinite series. We've done some of this with um, Taylor polynomials or Maclaurin that could be extended into series, and we've talked about some power series. What we're looking for now is we want to be able to take some functions and say what their equivalent infinite series is. And this um, basic series at the top is kind of how that's going to work. If you look at the series 1 plus x plus x squared, this is um, about the most basic um, power series that there is. It happens to be geometric that starts with 1 and gets multiplied by x every time. All right, we have x to the 0, x to the 1, x to the 2, and so on. And as long as we're within our interval of convergence, we know you know, back when you very first learned this, maybe in probability and stats class, an infinite series that starts with 1 and is multiplied by x will add up to this. You know, our formula, a1 over 1 minus r, that's this, with a particular a1 of 1 and r of x. So what we're going to try to do is take these functions that we're given and make them look like 1 over 1 minus x. If we can get it into the form of the sum of a geometric series, then we should be able to express it as a series. So here's our double starred statement of the day. Take the function, make it look like a1 over 1 minus r. So let's start with an example. Let's look at the function 1 over 2x minus 5. And these are going to have centers given to us. So we need to know where to base our power series. So this one's going to be centered at 0. So if I can make it look like a1 over 1 minus r, then I can express this function as an infinite series. All right, so a1 over 1 minus r. This one, I need to get a 1 in this bottom left location. So I'm going to start by just rearranging like that. Now this is pretty close, um, except I don't have a 1, I have a, a negative 5. So there are a couple ways to turn a negative 5 into a 1, one of which we can do and one of which we can't. If I need that negative 5 to be a 1, one option would be to add 6. But if I add 6, then I mess up the rest of the bottom. Instead of adding, let's multiply. How do you turn a negative 5 into a 1 through multiplication? Well, divide top and bottom by 5, or multiply top and bottom by 1 fifth. And technically, let's do that by negative 1 fifth, because, um, because I need it to turn into a positive 1. So I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by negative 1 fifth. You can, do, you can multiply the top and bottom by anything you want, as long as you do the same thing. So see what that does. It takes the top and makes it negative one-fifth. That's fine. There are no specifications on what the top needs to be. The number that matters is this one. I have to change it into a one. Now, the bottom, both terms are going to be multiplied by negative one-fifth. So I get a one minus, let's call that two-fifths x. Let's call it two x over five or however you want to arrange it. I'm just going to call it two-fifths x. So we have achieved our goal. We wanted to make it look like a one over one minus r. So a1 is negative one-fifth, and r is two-fifths x. Now, if we want to express this thing as a series, what we're going to do is we're going to put it into sigma notation. Think about this one up here. Another way to say this would be the sum from 0 to infinity of x to the n. Or, in general, the geometric one is the sum a1 r to the n minus 1. All right, if we start at 0, then that, excuse me, let's just make that r to the n if we're starting at 0. So all you have to do once you make it look like the desired form is write it like this. Starting at 0, going to infinity, a1, r to the n. So for us, 
going to start at zero, go to infinity. It's going to be negative one fifth times two fifths x to the n. So what we've created is an infinite series representation of the original function one over two x minus five, centered about zero. Now, when is this true? Remember up here, our starting one is only true when the radius of con or when the r, the common ratio, is between minus one and one. So how that applies down here is our r, our r down here, two fifths x needs to be between minus one and one. You could also write it like this: the absolute value of it needs to be less than one. And so to uh, figure out our distance from x, we're basically going to multiply both sides of this equation by 5 halves or divide by 2 fifths. And what we get is absolute value of x is less than 5 halves or, if you prefer interval notation, it's going to look like that. So overall answer, here's my infinite series, here's my radius of convergence. And both of those things will get asked. All right, so let's do one where it's not centered at zero. Makes it a little bit more complicated. Let's do the example 4 over 5 minus x, and let's center this one at 5. No, excuse me, let's center this one at negative 2. Now, we have a couple of issues. First of all, if it's going to be centered at negative 2, I need my x to be an x plus 2. All right? That's the problem I want to fix first. There are problems with the way this thing looks, and that's the first one I'm going to fix. So I'm going to start like this. Okay? I'm going to leave my 4 on top and I'm going to change my x to an x plus 2. And you can't just change that. You need to keep the bottom equivalent to what it was. My bottom was originally 5 minus x. If I want to change x to x plus 2, in reality I've lowered the bottom by 2 because this negative applies here. So if you lower the bottom by 2, you have to compensate by adding 2. And if you're not sure, if, sometimes those are a little tricky. If you're not sure, just distribute it and see what you get and make sure that these two things are the same, and they are now. So problem number one, I was not centered at the right place. Problem number two, it doesn't look like A1 over 1 minus R. Remember, your overall goal, double starred statement of the day, make it look like A1 over 1 minus R. So that's what we're working on next. And there are two aspects there. We need the one, really is our, our biggest thing, because we've already fixed the the um, x into x plus 2. So how do I make a 7 into a 1? Well, one option is you can subtract 6, but if you subtract 6, then you mess up the fact that we're centered at 2. So it's not really an option, it's a bad option. Instead, I'm going to multiply by 1 7th over 1 7th. So the top is 4 7ths, the bottom is 1 minus 1 7th x plus 2. So tell me about this infinite series. Well, this infinite series starts at 4 sevenths, and it is multiplied by 1 seventh x plus 2 each time. So then I want to kind of sum up my answer. My original question, which was 4 over 5 minus x, is equal to the series that starts at 4 sevenths and is multiplied by 1 seventh x plus 2 each time to the n. Again, when is this true? This isn't true everywhere. This is true only during the interval of convergence. So this is going to be true whenever 1 seventh x plus 2 is between minus 1 and 1 or when the absolute value is less than 1. Multiply by 7, you get x plus 2 is less than 7. So what this says is our distance from negative 2 can be no more than 7. So starting at negative 2, if you go both directions, 7, we're going to get negative 9 to 5. Now, the good thing about these is you don't have to worry about endpoints, whether those should be less than or equal to or just less than. 
because remember a geometric series doesn't converge at 1. It only converges if r is less than 1. So overall answer, here's the infinite series, here's the interval of convergence. All right, so most of the time that's going to be how we go about these. We get it, make it look like A1 over 1 minus R. Occasionally you won't be able to make it look like that, so we have to do a few more other tricks. Let's try one like this. Okay, so 2 over x plus 1 cubed. Occasionally, it doesn't work out. Because this bottom is cubed in that way, we can't really just m manipulate it and make it look like a1 over 1 minus r. So there's some sort of missing link between one that we can. The hint, which would be given in the book in this one, is that this function is equal to the second derivative of... 1 over x plus 1. Alright, so I believe you could convince yourself that that's true, that the derivative, if you take two derivatives of 1 over x plus 1, you get 2 over x plus 1 cubed. If not, just take those real quick and convince yourself. Now, I want, remember, my overall goal is an infinite series for this. My double starred rule of the day is make it look like a1 over 1 minus r, but I can't. I don't know how to do that yet, or I can't just do that straightforward. But what I can do, my goal, which is this, is equal to two derivatives of one that I can do. All right, really, I don't know I wrote that again. I was writing the same thing. So that's equal to two derivatives of... Now express this as an infinite series. Okay, well, what's going on inside these brackets? This is, this looks like 1 over 1 minus negative x, if you make it look like a1 over 1 minus r. So this is an infinite series that starts at 1 and is multiplied by negative x every time. So if we want to put that in the sigma notation, starting at 1 and multiplying by negative x every time, you can write it like this. You could also write it as negative 1 to the n times x to the n. But either way, we're going to get the same result. Okay, so I need to take two derivatives of that. All right, we're just kind of going in a chain of events here. My result that I'm looking for is the second derivative of this function. Well, this function can be expressed as, a, as an infinite series. So let's take two derivatives. Well, my second derivative of this is the first derivative of this thing's derivative. All right, so what's this thing's derivative? When you take a derivative, you drop the n in the front, and then you decrease it by 1. So we're going to have n times x to the n minus 1. the chain rule sort of shows up. Let me actually backtrack a minute. Instead of writing it this way, this is going to make our derivatives easier. Easier. So go back with me for a second. Let's make that first one negative 1 to the n, x to the n. It's the same thing. It just keeps that negative separate, and it makes our life easier from here on out. So my first derivative, negative 1 to the n, this just lets me carry that down. And it makes me not have to worry about the chain rule. Now the derivative of x to the n, n x to the n minus 1. I need to start at 1 now because of the n being in my series. If I start at 0, that term's just going to get wiped out anyway. So there's the first derivative. I need to take one more in order to get my final answer. So for a similar reason, I'm going to start this one at 2. Negative 1 to the n is going to be the constant. And now I have n, n minus 1, x to the n minus 2. 
And since I can take all these derivatives, my radius of convergence never changes. It's the same as it was up here. My radius of convergence is still minus 1 to 1. So those are a little bit tougher to follow, but just let's talk through it one more time. I'm giving you a function that we cannot make look like a1 over 1 minus r. It's not that simple. But the missing link here is that it's the second derivative of one that we can. So there's little hints sometimes that can get you on the right track. So take this one that can be represented by an infinite series, represent it by an infinite series here, and then take two derivatives of it, and you're left with our final answer. All right, our original function, which was our goal, is equal to this infinite series, which is the goal of this section in total. Okay, so let's do it. Let, let's call that a video. That's um, eight, nine. One more section in this chapter, and then we'll start talking about a test. But uh, for now, that's eight, nine, and young out.